thanks everyone for for showing up to this very fun uh, and special event. My name is Ethan Cross. I'm a professor of psychology and management here at the University of Michigan, and I'm going to be your your master of ceremonies tonight, which means that uh, primarily I'm just going to make sure everyone stays on time and we get to the cocktail reception hour when we're supposed to. Um, I want to start by, by just sharing with you uh, an observation that I came across recently that I have not been able to stop thinking about. It came from a, a piece that a journalist wrote, uh, a New York Times journalist, about his brother who has struggled with bipolar disorder uh, for, for his entire life. About 40, uh, no, 60 years ago, uh, to this month, John Kennedy, our president, uh, gave a speech at Rice University, which many of you are likely familiar with. This was his moonshot speech in which he uh, famously declared that we will land astronauts on the moon within the, path, within the next decade. What you may not know, uh, which I didn't know at the time, is that a few months later, Kennedy had another set of aspirational goals that he offered to Congress, which is, we will cure mental illness. Now, if you ask, how did we do? So within the next eight years, well ahead of schedule, we landed astronauts on the moon. If you look at the state of mental illness today in this country and the world more generally, I think you could say that we completely failed to meet Kennedy's aspirational goals. If you look at the statistics surrounding depression, it's pretty chilling. Uh, over a quarter of a billion people worldwide suffer from depression. Depression is the leading source of disability worldwide. And according to a recent estimate from the World Health Organization, the, the cost that depression and anxiety, which depression is closely linked to, exerts on the global economy in terms of lost productivity is $1 trillion. That is a very big number. It's $1 trillion, and that estimate is projected to grow exponentially over the next 10 years. I think what these statistics really highlight is the need for us to identify novel and creative solutions for addressing this issue, which is why I am so excited to be with you all here today and to be a member of this Depression Center uh, endeavor. Now, over the course of the past few years, I've had a chance to interact closely with the leadership team of the Depression Center. And I can tell you that there is a very acute recognition of how urgent it is to move past the business as usual approaches to trying to identify how to combat depression, to identify new, potentially game-changing um, insights into managing this condition. And there's a lot of energy and enthusiasm behind these approaches, which is what we're going to hear about today. Now, before we get started, I want to introduce to you the uh, director of the Depression Center, Dr. Srijan Sen. Um, Dr. Sen is the Francis. This is going to take a while. There is a lot of... Uh, of, of titles behind next to Dr. Sen's name. Dr. Sen is a Francis and Kenneth Eisenberg Professor of Depression and Neurosciences and the director of the Francis and Kenneth Eisenberg and Family Depression Center. He's also a professor of psychiatry, a research professor at the Michigan Neuroscience Institute, and an adjunct professor of psychology. Now, less well known, but equally commendation worthy, Dr. Sen is also a member of the highly prestigious Connor O'Neill's pub trivia team. So you should feel free to ask any esoteric questions you have, and my, the judges and I will happily divert them to you. Um, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Sen on the stage. We lost last week by one point because of my Poor knowledge of modern music, so it's a sore point. But uh, but thank you. I'll add my thanks to Ethan's for um, all of you coming here and and um, and celebrating with us. Um, I'm really excited about this first uh, Psych Tank event. It's it's 
the first um, event we're having out of this research innovation core, um, and along with the mobile technology core and, and data and design, these are initiatives that we're rolling out from the center and we're really excited about. And they're all designed to help you guys, help all of our really talented, wonderful members um, uh, to create uh, research programs and innovations that collectively can really transform how we um, understand and, and approach and treat depression. The Innovations Core in particular um, is meant to take advantage of the, the creativity and, and the breadth of, uh, of knowledge and expertise across campus, um, really to try to help help all of us come up with our best ideas and feel empowered to follow through and, and get beyond the status quo that Ethan talked about, um, uh, to work across lines and, and build interdisciplinary teams that can tackle these really thorny, important uh, problems, and then hopefully empower you with resources and support to really succeed in that. Um, I think the projects that we'll hear about today from the psych tank competitors really embody that and are wonderful examplars of, um, of this approach. Um, you, you'll see that they've been inspired by patients and the communities and the state of uh, the field to come up with really innovative ideas um, and novel projects. And, and you're going to love these, these presentations. I hope that you'll both enjoy the presentations, but also take the chance to um, feel inspired and motivated to uh, come up with your own ideas and, and let us know how you can help, how we can help you develop them and, and move them forward. Um, this wonderful event was possible because of our, our incredible team at the Depression Center, so I wanted to take a moment to thank them, um, uh, the whole team, but particularly um, Karen Dugas, Patty Delden, uh, Connie Harrigan, uh, Maria Thomas, um, for, for helping to bring this together and getting us here today. Um, I'll thank Ethan for, for being our wonderful master of ceremonies and our esteemed panel of judges. Um, uh, we're also really grateful for, to the Eisenberg family for, uh, for making this possible. Their, their transformative gift last year um, helped us come up with this new version of the Depression Center and, and these ambitions and, and make events like the Psych Tank possible. Um, the uh, Ken Eisenberg and the family's friendship and, and unwavering support has meant the world to me, to our team, and, and to the patients suffering with depression. Um, this is the first event this week. I hope you guys will join us tomorrow uh, at 4 p.m. at the League for, um, for another event celebrating the Eisenberg family with a series of, of lightning talks and um, uh, remarks and reception um, uh, celebrating the Eisenberg family. So um, we'll take a moment to thank them. Um, and thanks again for all of you for coming. I'll pass it on back to Ethan and, and get started. Thanks. Right, thank you. So, um, so here's how, how this afternoon is going to work. First, we're going to hear from our, our three Breakthrough Award finalists. Um, so these Breakthrough Awards are really meant to, to be our first step at, at, at pr providing these kinds of potentially game-changing solutions to addressing issues relevant to depression. And so each group is gonna have 15 minutes to pitch their idea to our sharks, who you will hear from soon, um, psych tank, shark tank. And um, they'll talk for 15 minutes, and then the, the judges will have five minutes to, I was about to say interrogate, but that's probably not the right choice of words, to ask questions and, and satisfy their curiosities about the project. Um, and then we'll cycle through to the next set of, 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 of presenters. So we'll go through three different groups. Um, when they're done, the judges are going to go off stage. They'll deliberate uh, about who won our competition. And when they're off deliberating, we're going to bring up our, our Seeds of Change Award recipients. So Seeds of Change Awards are a different mechanism I like to think of this as like a really good deal for the Depression Center because this is um, low resource but high impact research. So there are three groups of individuals who've won these awards and we're going to hear for each, from each of them for about 10 minutes and we'll, we'll give them uh, a beautiful award that the Depression Center leadership has brought with them uh, today. 
when that's done, we'll learn about our winners and we'll go have our, our cocktails. So um, let's meet our judges before we get started. Um, we've got Dr. Greg, and, and apologize, apologies if I get the name pronunciation where we've got Dr. Uh, Gregory Dalek, the Daniel E. Ofoot Professor of Psychiatry and Chair of the Department of Psychiatry. Fun fact about Professor Dalek, he has performed in Carnegie Hall, the real one in New York City, uh, twice in his life, so maybe you'll tell us a little bit more about that later on. Um, we have uh, seated just on the other side of, of um, two down, Dr. Paul Pfeiffer, who is the Susan Krumpecker Brown Research Professor of Depression and Associate Professor of Psychiatry. Interesting factoid about Dr. Pfeiffer, mm -hmm. despite having an identical twin, under the threat of harsh interrogation, he swears that he never once tried to deceive his parents, <laughs> which I find really interesting, insightful into your personality. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, uh, Dr. Craig Rodriguez Sejas, a, a colleague of mine in the psychology department where he's an assistant professor. You really didn't hold back in giving me some personal information. Uh, so um, I'm trying to think about what to share here. But um, so Dr. Sejas uh, has a deaf dog. And he is convinced that this really contributes to his safety because it means that his dog doesn't attack him when he sings songs at home <laughs> out of tune. Uh, finally, uh, Marion Udell Phillips, uh, principal of Moo 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 Consulting, Moo Consulting, a lecturer at both the University of Michigan School of Public Health and, and School of Public Policy, and a senior advisor uh, to the Center for Health and Research, uh, Health and Research Transformation at the university. Now. When I sent out a request for fun facts from, from our judges, I gave a couple of examples. So the first one of which, you know, if like you ever happen to have dinner with Obama, like let me know. And sure enough, you did have dinner with Obama. <laughs> he touched your shoulder, it all went fine, it didn't make Fox, and, um, and, and uh, you'll tell us about that later on. So uh, these are our judges. Thank you all for, for the job you're about to do. Uh, our first Breakthrough Award finalist presentation is titled Rhythm and Blues, Changing the Clock to Breakthrough in Bipolar Disorder. The PI is Dr. Leslie Swanson, an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry. Her co-investigators on the project are Dr. Helen Burgess, a professor of psychiatry, Dr. Melvin McInnes, Thomas B. and Nancy Upjohn Woodworth, professor of bipolar disorder and depression, and Dr. Sarah Sperry, assistant professor of psych psychiatry and an adjunct assistant professor of psychology. Dr. Sperry is gonna be co-presenting with Dr. Swanson. And are you guys ready? Good afternoon, everyone. My co-presenter, Dr. Sarah Sperry, and I are delighted to be here this afternoon to talk with you all about rhythm and blues, changing the clock to break through in bipolar disorder. This work is a true interdisciplinary team effort with the Sleep and Circadian Research Lab joining forces with the Prechter Bipolar Program. I'd also like to acknowledge our other investigative team members, Dr. Helen Burgess and Dr. Melvin McInnes. I'm gonna start by telling you a story, one that maybe we can all relate to on a bad night here or there, but one that someone with bipolar disorder lives through on many nights. Let me set the stage. This is Sam. Sam has bipolar disorder and he needs to go to sleep but he is feeling wide awake. He can't seem to turn his brain off. He's thinking, I have to be up for work tomorrow at 6 a.m. I need to fall asleep. What if I can't go to work tomorrow because I can't sleep? Should I call in to work so I can get more sleep? Sam's thoughts escalate. I can't call in to work again. 
I'm going to get fired. But what if I make a mistake at work and someone gets hurt? Sam's not sure what to do. Should I take more meds? Should I not take more meds? His thoughts turn to what happened the last time he didn't sleep. I'm going to get depressed. I'm going to spiral. I don't want to go to the hospital again. In reality, what happened to Sam was that he had a relapse to a depressive episode. He missed work over the next few days. He was fired from his job. He developed suicidal thoughts. And he was indeed hospitalized again. This story describes about 70% of individuals living with bipolar disorder who consistently report these types of sleep disturbances. Now, bipolar disorder is a mental health condition characterized by mood instability. This includes things like depressive episodes, as well as mania and hypomania. Now, I've put up the symptoms here, but what I really want to focus on is these two symptoms. In both depression and mania, we see that individuals have really concrete sleep changes. In depression, they might be sleeping too much or too little. And in mania, they report a decreased need for sleep. What's not highlighted here is that individuals with bipolar disorder also report these types of sleep disturbances, regardless of whether they're in a mood episode. Now, one potential reason why individuals with bipolar disorder have these sleep problems is because they have a mismatch between their brain clock time and the actual time of the clock on the wall. So in other words, if I'm an individual with bipolar disorder and I get in bed at 1 a.m. and I'm ready to go to sleep, I can't fall asleep because my brain actually thinks it's 8 p.m. The circadian clock is located in our brain, and it's the master timekeeper for our bodies. One of its major jobs is to regulate our sleep-wake cycle and the timing of when we sleep. Our clocks all run on their own individual time, which is in part determined by genetics. Some people are morning larks who have clocks that run early. These are the people who like to be up early in the morning and go to bed earlier in the evening. And then we have our night owls who like to be up very late into the evening and sleep late into the day. We can tell your own circadian clock time by testing when your brain starts to make a hormone called melatonin. Melatonin prepares us for bed, it makes us sleepy, and it, uh, it, it gets us ready to fall asleep when we, when we want to. In a healthy adult, whose, whose circadian clock in their brain is running in sync with the actual clock time, what we see is that melatonin starts to be released in the brain about 90 minutes to two hours before our usual bedtime. And this means that we're ready to sleep when we need to, to fall asleep when we, need to, when we need to. Now, what we see in unipolar depression is that the clock runs a bit late and melatonin starts much closer to bedtime in unipolar depression. But look what happens in bipolar disorder. And this is also a phenomenon that we, deserve, that we observe in night owls. In bipolar disorder, we see that the clock runs really, really late, as evidenced by a melatonin start time after bedtime. And what this means is that people who have a, a late clock like this are going to have a hard time falling asleep at a socially required time when they want to. A really late circadian clock is unique. It's a unique feature to bipolar disorder. And again, I just want to show you unipolar depression, bipolar depression to highlight that. Now, there are extremely high rates of night owls with bipolar disorder. So here you see individuals with bipolar disorder who are in a depressive episode. About 65% of them report that they're a night owl. Now, when we look at those with bipolar disorder who aren't in a mood in, uh, episode, they're asymptomatic, we see about 26% of them uh, report being a night owl. This is really drastic considering only 1.3% of the general population reports being a night owl. Now, we have a really unique opportunity here at the University of Michigan. The Heinz C. Prechter Bipolar Research Program has a longitudinal cohort of participants Right now, we have close to 1,400 participants, 846 of which have bipolar disorder, who have been followed for a median of nine years. 
And these individuals report on their mood, their sleep, and their circadian preference multiple times per year over the course of study. Now I'm gonna share a striking statistic with you that's very in line with the one that Ethan shared with you before. Of the nearly 6,000 depression assessments we've done over the last six years on this cohort, 59% of those scores have returned, uh, indicated that people are experiencing at least mild levels of depression. This really highlights to me that we aren't moving the needle in bipolar depression if 60% are consistently depressed. In addition, 50% of this cohort report being night owls. So again, we're seeing this large overlap between bipolar disorder and being a night owl. Being a night owl doesn't just mean that they're having problems falling asleep. We've shown that our night owls have more se severe depressive symptoms. They have more depressive episodes over the course of their illness. Others have also shown that being a night owl with bipolar disorder, you have less time in remission and you have overall worse functioning. Now, discreet, despite this morbidity between being a night owl and having bipolar disorder, there are zero circadian treatments for bipolar disorder. This is a huge gap in our treatment development. But we do have a treatment that works to correct the circadian clock in individuals who are night owls who do not have bipolar disorder. And this therapy is a tiny dose of melatonin administered at the correct time, which is five hours before bed, as well as a scheduled one hour period of dim light prior to bed so that your environment is dark before you go to sleep. Now with this treatment, you meet with the clinician weekly, uh, once every week for four weeks. And every week, the clinician advances the time that you take the melatonin, your dim light time and your time in bed schedule by one hour across four weeks until you get to a point where you're able to fall asleep at your desired bedtime. Our group has tested this treatment in night owls, again, who do not have bipolar disorder. And we found that in night owls, this treatment advances the circadian clock, moves it in the right direction by a very substantial 90 minutes. What this translates to in terms of a time in bed schedule is an individual who's able to fall asleep 100 minutes earlier and wake up 80 minutes earlier after just four weeks of treatment. I wanna take a minute for everyone to think about the big impact this kind of shift in a sleep schedule might have for someone who's a night owl. They can fall asleep in time to get up to go to work, they can see their friends during the day, and they can get more sleep generally. It was the results from this study that inspired us to partner with the Prechter Bipolar Program because we know that there are very high rates of night owls and bipolar disorder, but there are no effective treatments for that condition specifically tested in bipolar disorder. And I do wanna point out that there are a lot of advantages to a low dose melatonin taken in the afternoon for someone with bipolar disorder. These advantages include things like it's very widely available over the counter. You can walk into Walgreens and find melatonin without a prescription. It has very few side effects. It's, in, uh, it's uh, not associated with a stigma because a lot of people take melatonin. And it's very easy to incorporate into your daily routine. And finally, it is quite low cost. So, we propose to do the first test of this type of intervention in bipolar disorder. Leveraging the Prechter Longitudinal Cohort, we'll recruit 30 people with bipolar disorder who report being a night owl and having at least mild symptoms of depression. Half will go into the active treatment and half will go into a placebo control. When I say placebo control, I mean they're gonna get a sugar pill instead of melatonin and they're gonna get some basic sleep education instead of the dim light uh, an hour before bed and the set bedtime. You might be thinking to yourself, why test this in bipolar disorder if we you know, saw those amazing results in night owls? Let's just start doing it. Well, the problem is, is that the studies testing its efficacy in night owls explicitly excluded those with bipolar disorder. So it's our job to establish that this treatment is safe and feasible for those with bipolar disorder, critically ensuring that it does not induce hypomania or mania. 
Lastly, we really want to begin to understand the mechanisms of this treatment and whether it has an impact on depressive symptoms for individuals with bipolar disorder. Now, we're going to measure whether this treatment works with cutting edge technology, much of which has been developed by our team here at University of Michigan. First, we're going to measure the circadian clock time. Participants from the comfort of their own home are going to give us some saliva samples multiple times a day up until their bedtime. This is gonna allow us to test whether we're actually shifting when the brain produces melatonin earlier. We're also gonna measure sleep and activity. Using the gold standard in-home assessment of wrist actigraphy, participants are gonna wear a watch that's gonna help us see when they go to bed and when they wake up to allow us to test whether we are shifting that sleep and wake cycle earlier. Lastly, we're going to measure depression. So participants are going to have an interview with a clinician to establish depression symptoms. They're going to fill out self-reports on their depression, and they're going to answer questions about their depression in the moment using their smartphone. This is a method called ecological momentary assessment. This will allow us to tell whether as we shift melatonin and sleep, we're actually making an impact on depressive symptoms on a day-to-day -day basis in their real-world environments. Now, we're not going to just test whether it works. We're also going to test whether it's safe. We'll measure side effects, symptoms of mania or hypomania, suicidality, and whether people stay in the treatment till the end. With respect to the study timeline, we'll spend the first three months of the study preparing to actually carry out the study. And that includes activities like IRB approvals and training and hiring staff. Then over the next 18 months, we plan to enroll approximately two participants per month. And in the final three months of the grant, we will be analyzing the data, presenting our results at conferences and in papers, as well as writing new grant proposals based on the data. We will spend the budget on paying participants, study materials and supplies, as well as effort for study personnel. Now back to Sam. Sam's at the end of our study. He's taken his melatonin at the right time. He's been in dim light before bed. And he's actually looking forward to going to bed because he knows he's going to fall asleep early and easily. He's falling asleep quickly because his brain clock time now matches the clock time on the wall. And his brain is making melatonin well in advance of his bedtime. So he's ready to fall asleep when he wants to. He wakes up feeling rested and refreshed. Sam, as a result of the study, Sam's able to fall asleep earlier and um, earlier than he was before. He's able to sleep for longer periods at night. He's seen uh, an improvement in his depression symptoms, which means that he's been able to find a new job. And he knows how to manage if he has trouble falling asleep again in the future. And his clock and his mood have both shifted in the right direction at the end of this treatment. Places will go with these findings. I do hope because we see such uh, nice findings in night owls that we just imagine the kind of relief we can get, get for people who have bipolar disorder with this therapy. And the places we're going to take this work include a larger scale clinical trial by obtaining NIH funding, testing out this treatment in different bipolar disorder phases, t understanding the mechanisms of this treatment. How does it work? What are the key ingredients? How can we personalize this treatment to match this treatment uh, so that to the people that it will work best uh, for? And ultimately, one of our goals is to have an app for that. And what we'd really like to be able to do is for you to use your watch or your smartphone to track your sleep-wake patterns, and then for that app to tell you when to take your melatonin so that we can prevent a recurrence of a depressive episode in individuals with bipolar disorder. So where we're at. Uh, we're not moving the needle much. New treatments for bipolar depression have remained fairly stagnant. We've seen increases in suicide, increases in disability, and particularly wor worrisome increased rates of health disparities, meaning treatments are not equally accessible to all. With this Breakthrough Innovation Award, we hope to start to move that needle in the right direction. We want to improve the treatments we have for bipolar depression, thereby reducing rates of suicide and disability. And importantly, with this particular intervention we're proposing, 
It's affordable, easily accessed, doesn't require a prescription, and so has the potential to reach a much broader audience of people suffering from bipolar disorder. So with that, we say good night, thank you for coming, and we hope you have a really good sleep. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, thank you for that wonderful, wonderful presentation. Uh, I must confess, I had slide envy when uh, when I was watching you go through your slides. It was so beautifully done, uh, and the dramatization at the beginning and end with with uh, the with Sam, very very impressive. Um, so we're going to take a couple of minutes uh, to switch mics. So if people have to uh, use. Oh, questions. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, come back up. I think judges just take it away. You look like you have a, you have a question. Go for it. Is this on? Yeah. Yes. Great. Um, thank you so much for that presentation. You're, you're, you're making me want to try it out. <laughs> Get better sleep. Um, a, question, a couple of questions for you. One about the population that you'd be studying and what their demographic and ethnic and racial makeup looks like. How diverse a population is it? And can you say a little bit more about uh, the population where the initial study was done uh, that showed that um, melatonin worked for night owls? Sure. I'll take the question about who we'll be bringing in and their picture, and then Leslie can take uh, the original study. So the Proctor Longitudinal Study has recruited people f largely from Michigan, um, thereby it represents the general <laughs> breakdown of the Ann Arbor and Southeast Michigan um, ethnic and racial breakdown. It's about 88% white. Um, we have an explicit effort right now to increase underrepresented minorities in our recruitment. And in fact, right now we're limiting recruitment, recruitment to people under 30 and people who identify as non-white. So it's an explicit goal of ours to improve that. Um, that being said, of the 30 that we pick, we hope to um, match on demographics, age, sex, and have a diverse array of um, race and ethnicity representation. And I can say for our trial, uh, night owls who are, who are healthy and don't have comorbid psychiatric conditions tend to be quite young. So these were a lot of U of M college students and uh, our population reflected the, the greater Ann Arbor population with respect to demographics. So about 85% of our sample was white, um, but they did uh, trend towards younger adults. So I think our average age was about 26. So I, is this on? I just want to commend you on a great talk presentation uh, as well. The slides were great. Uh, it's a very exciting proposal, just the fact that melatonin is so widely available and safe that you could just make this small tweak and have a large effect is really exciting. I'm just wondering if you could comment on the likely durability of the change. Is this something that can be sustained long term beyond the, the couple weeks? Yeah, so I can say at the end of the night owl trial, what we did was um, give people instructions about how to continue take mel taking melatonin if they wish to, but also you can maintain these gains typically. I say this from clinical practice. If people are willing to maintain a consistent time in bed schedule seven days a week, you can maintain the gains that you've made with melatonin. But there is not a lot of data looking at this at long-term durability, so I'm mostly speaking from clinical experience. Do we have time for one more? Okay. Um, sure. Yeah, great presentation. Thanks, y'all. Um, looking in the proposal, though, you talked about that higher doses of melatonin have been more studied. And I was just trying to get an idea of what the difference is between the, how high are we talking about compared to the 0.5 milligrams y'all are proposing here? Yeah, so those studies used, I think, between 5 and 10 milligram doses of melatonin. So if you're taking melatonin as a chronobiotic, you want to take a teeny dose. So that's where we propose a half milligram dose. Whereas if you're using it for a soporific or if as an antioxidant, then we see the higher doses. Um, but it's a, those are very different uh, dose ranges than we, what we propose in our study. And that's important because I think most people go to the drugstore being like, I'm not sleeping well. Let me try to take as much melatonin as possible. So it is going to be important to talk about education with them that more is not better in this case. We have time for a couple more questions if folks have one. Um, in the, thank you again for a um, really nice proposal. In the um, 
document, you talked a little bit about the home dim light um, melatonin onset test. Is this, and I'm a little bit familiar with that, is this the first time it's being tested in this population? It is the first time it's being used in bipolar disorder, but I have an R01 where we're using it with women who are, have postpartum depression and they have six month old infants. Um, so, and they're, ca they're capable of using it at home, but this would be the first test in bipolar disorder. Uh, we also used it with our night owls, but obviously they didn't have psychiatric comorbidities. I guess my other question is just, um, could this delayed phase sleep just be a, a, a marker of bipolar disorder and not a, a part of a causal pathway? And I'm just wondering about that. Is there, a, is there a neurochemical basis for delayed sleep in connection to bipolar? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question and one that uh, we don't have a preponderance of data on to support yet, but there's certainly an overlap in terms of the genetics that underlie a delayed sleep-wake phase and bipolar disorder, so there's some shared genes there. Um, but I do think when we take a look at the longitudinal data where we follow people across time, we do very much see that uh, being a night owl does increase the risk for relapse to depressive episodes and other things, which makes me think that it does play an important prospective role. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you very much. Just out of curiosity, so we, now we're gonna do the bathroom break. If you have one, go take one. Um, the next group is gonna get mic'd up. So should we, do you guys wanna go back and? Yeah, let's switch it out. And while we're waiting, I did, I did have a question. It's not going to factor into the evaluation at all, but um, has anyone ever looked at the synchronization between the circadian clock of, of partners as a predictor of marital satisfaction. Highly correlated. Yeah. Yeah, that could be another avenue of intervention. Yeah. I'm going to stop talking about relationships now. Uh, so, uh, Marion, do you want to tell us about, about dinner with Obama? Where was it? What was the? What was it like? Well, it was. It was actually at Denise Illich's house. Many of you know Denise as uh -huh. a regent. And actually, if, you know, if you've never been to Denise Illich's house, you know her family owned the Tigers. It is quite a house to walk into because she literally has the Tigers from the old Comerica, or Tiger Stadium in the in, in her living room. Wow. <laughs> hanging over those huge, um, huge uh, concrete structures. So, I mean, he's just, he was just amazing. You know, he was incredibly inspirational. Um, I will say that when presidents are running for office, they are a lot more accessible than when they're actually in office, mm. right? So um, it might have been a uh, easier time to, to have dinner with him. Um, but uh, if any of you have read any of his books or heard Michelle Obama's book, he is just the way that he's described, just so knowledgeable, so thoughtful. It was, it was quite a wonderful experience. Yeah, sounds like one, an experience that you, you, you do not forget. Um, Gregory, do you want to tell us about um, your performance? And we have some instruments backstage, so. Um, you assume it was an instrument, Dr. That's, Cross. That's right. Um, so I'd be interested in um, guesses from the audience, but we don't have time for that. Um, I was a, a mediocre baritone horn player in high school, um, but they needed baritone horn players, and my high school graduated from Carnegie Hall. So in the junior and senior year in, uh, um, in high school, I ended up playing in Carnegie Hall, and we sounded absolutely magnificent. It was hard not to sound good in that setting. Sounds incredible. So, uh, Mics are, are we, are we ready to roll with the next? Okay, great. Um, okay, so without further ado, our second uh, award finalist, uh, the title of their presentation is Mental Health Care for All Kids. What are we waiting for? Uh, Dr. Sandra Graham Berman, my colleague from psychology, where she's a professor of psychology and psychiatry, is a PI. And her co-eyes are Dr. Andrew Groken Keller and Dr. Cecilia Voda. Why don't you come on up? Hello. You may have heard that we have a mental health crisis in America. 
President Biden just made a speech about that last week. And we know from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services that this is a crisis in the state of Michigan as well. The CDC says the need is great and it's growing. And COVID has taken a big bite out of mental health for children in America. I'm a professor of psychology and psychiatry here at the University of Michigan. And about once or twice a month, I get an email from somebody who could be a friend or another parent asking for a referral for an evaluation or for a therapist to help their child who has depression or anxiety. So I give them my usual list. It's a really good list of people I've trained, people we know, and all the great um, you know, resources in our state. And they come back about a week later and they say, well, thank you, but they're all full. We don't have any more room. People don't even have some waiting lists anymore. But sometimes the wait is eight months. It could be even a year to get an evaluation for children. Um, how many of you are parents here, by the way? Just Right, so imagine that this is your child. Imagine that your child has a mental health problem and is suffering and you can't get the help that you need. Now imagine this if you didn't have a job, you don't have an income. What if you didn't have insurance? What if you lived in an area where there was no clinic available, even with a waiting list? Um, this is a problem. This is a problem of resources. There are not enough providers. This is the problem that we are trying to solve with this study. We should not have to pick and choose who gets the health care in America. So what are the numbers? OK, this is from the CDC. And you can see the light blue box. These are all for children who are 6 to 12 years old. That's the area that I study. Um, kids with depression, it's about 4%. Kids who are diagnosed with anxiety, almost 10%. Um, most of these kids have another diagnosis. 75% have more than one diagnosis. And then there are the kids who are what we call prodromal. They have a lot of symptoms, but they don't make it right over the line to get an actual diagnosis. So the need is bigger than what this chart shows. We're trying to help kids before they get to adolescence, when the stakes are even higher, the effects are greater, and the risks are much, much greater as well. Locally, one in five kids in the state of Michigan has a mental health problem. So the need is great, and we are trying very hard to do something about it. Kids with depression have depressed mood, sleep problems, fatigue, all the things that we just heard about, um, which is a risk factor for them in terms of social development, terms of academic development, being able to perform adequately in school. Kids who are depressed can be irritable. They can be very aggressive. Um, a lot of kids feel hopeless. They can't imagine a positive future for themselves. And they're certainly at risk for suicide in adolescence. Anxiety is another issue, a big serious problem for kids. Um, it's a very adaptive emotion. We want to have fear. We want to be able to worry so that we can stay safe. We can keep ourselves protected. But sometimes, with an excess of anxiety, it interferes with optimal development. So again, poor academic achievement, um, trouble with interpersonal relationships, and just lots of research on the physiological effects that that can help, help uh, have on physical health, too. Kids with anxiety are three and a half times more likely to have doctor visits. They're six times more likely to be hospitalized than children who don't have anxiety. Um, so what are we trying to do about this? Well, presently, this is the mental health model, right? Individual therapy, if, even if you can get in, you get through the evaluation, you get there, and you get some kind of behavioral cognitive therapy, typically with a professional, social worker, psychiatrist, psychologist. And this will depend on your insurance, but on the availability of some sort of um, you know, clinic or hospital near you. Typically, people who get help by the time you get in, the problem is very serious. So what's wrong with that? That's what we're doing, business as usual, right? Well, service providers are not available. There aren't enough. And there's a stigma getting a diagnosis as a child. There's uneven access to care. And these are big issues for underrepresented groups, people who live in rural areas. There's waiting lines, but Typically, there's no prevention. We're not even at the point where we can 
deal with the problem, never mind begin to do something about it before it becomes more serious. And most therapies treat symptoms of a specific diagnosis rather than treating the whole child. But we should also keep in mind that the treatments are not 100% effective either. And typically, only about 20% of people finish the entire course of therapy that's prescribed to them. So we have problems that fix, need to be fixed, and we can do better. What if we could reduce depression and anxiety symptoms earlier in the life of kids? What if we can reduce that percentage of kids with a diagnosis, like shave off a couple of percentage points? Wouldn't that be amazing? What if we can enhance their emotion regulation and build lots of skills in a biopsychosocial approach to address the whole person? What if we could provide mental health for all kids? We could use schools with teachers as people who can provide some help. We can use evidence-based practices, things that we know work from many, many, many years of evaluating best practices. We can teach skills, we can build competence, and there's a lot of research showing that when we can do that, children's symptoms of depression and anxiety can be reduced. So, how can we do this? Well, I have spent 30 years older, um, studying a program called the Kids Club Program, and it was developed for kids exposed to family violence. Um, it's for kids 6 to 12 years old. It's a group therapy program, 10 sessions typically. Service providers who work in shelters or community agencies are the therapist. We use best evidence-based practices and techniques, and the goal is to reduce anxiety and depression and improve coping. Well, several randomized controlled trials later, we're able to show that this 10-session program reduced 50% of kids with a diagnosis in internalizing problems, anxiety and depression. 20% reduced um, their diagnosis of externalizing or conduct disordered problems. Um, we, this program has done very, very well. It's now going in 38 states and five countries. Talk about dissemination. The latest one is Singapore and uh, New Brunswick in, in Canada. Um, all of the materials, there are workbooks for kids, there are training manuals as well that are followed, have been translated into several languages. And we have done this program with different populations and adapted it for use with um, Alaska Natives, with people, um, immigrants who are in Brownsville, Texas, coming back and forth across the border, et cetera. So this program has really done well, but I was interested in trying to spread it out. Maybe we could do something like this for all children. What are we waiting for? And so I discovered the Mood Lifters program for adults. And this was interesting to me because it was a program that relied on you know, communities, education, empowerment, about five areas of people's lives, emotions, social relationships, looking at physical health, improving, you know, cognitions and behavior. The model included um, meeting in groups, providing information just like the Kids Club program did, but also homework and checking in and practicing the skills that were learned, and then rewards for doing well. This sounded like a really good match. So working with uh, Dr. Vota, developing this program for becoming, uh, become sorry, becoming mood lifters for kids as a melding of the Kids Club program with the model of the mood lifters program. And this is kind of what we do. We use um, activities for kids. There's education and information. The materials are there available. When we apply the lesson, children then design how they're going to practice it in the coming week at home. There are 12 sessions, but they cover emotions. Fears and worries, how can you understand fears and worries and what can you do about that? Emotions, how I, to identify how you're feeling, how other people are feeling. How to identify when you're feeling distressed and what can you do to calm your body down? How about changing negative thoughts about what's possible for solving problems and feeling better? So at the end, we have a celebration um, and a big party. It's research is supported each of these sessions, there's research behind every single topic for the kids 
describing exactly how this contributes to well-being and positive mental health. This is both primary and secondary intervention because we're treating all children. Some may have a diagnosis, some may be you know, having high symptoms, and others may not, but they could develop that in the future. We did um, a pilot study of this Mood Lifters for Kids program. Actually, we started back in 2020, doing this in five classrooms in Dickon Elementary School. And I don't know if you remember what happened in March of 2020. The school closed. 100% we were stopped. We had 150 families already interviewed halfway through the program, six sessions in. Boom, it was over. It took about a year for me to get over that, thinking, oh, it's going to get better. We all thought at first, maybe, you know, it's going to go away. We, could, we can still deal with things. But eventually, we moved the study online. And these are the results of that study for 6 to 12-year-old kids. Um, the problem was, it was online. They were already online all day long in school, right? And also, it was mostly white people, not as many um, kids in underrepresented or other represented groups as we wanted. Um, but still, we were able to complete the program, and these very preliminary results suggest that this could be useful in reducing symptoms of depression and anxiety. We also enhanced emotion regulation here. So what we want to do is be able to, you know, take this on, but with a better, you know, better chance, better population. Well, we are already um, involved in the school. We are in Dickens School, elementary school, and we're starting in two weeks in, um, in a charter school also in Ann Arbor. So our representation will be greater, we hope. Um, everyone's going to benefit. The schools are clamoring for this. Um, Gretchen Whitmer, the governor, wants to have programs such as this in schools to reduce the burden on the school and on teachers, classrooms, families, et cetera. It costs $12 billion, to reflect uh, Ethan's point, for uh, mental health care in America a year. That's crazy. We can do so much better. So we have a great team. It's an interdisciplinary group. I'd like to introduce Dr. Andy grogan Kaler, who's the Sandra Danzinger Professor of Social Work. <laughs> And this is Dr. Cecilia Vota, who is not here, she's in, in Florida, but also um, our project coordinator, Ellie Maley, is here as well. So we're grateful for this team. We all have a very strong social justice bent. We're very interested in providing services for people in the community. Um, we have expertise. Andy and I have worked together for about 15 years and Ellie and I for at least four. So the team is good, we're ready to go. We've got all the materials and the time is now. So the study design is to take a group of kids who participate in the Mood Lifters for Kids program and compare them to kids who do not. But in this study, we also then provide the program after the 12 weeks to those children who were in the comparison group so that we don't leave anybody out. Um, we want to do 30 kids online as well with a, a broader sample this time to compare whether we can be as effective when we're doing the program online as we are in a school classroom. So we hope that we're going to be able to um, provide this program, get kind of the same results in a school setting at a very low cost, and this would literally change the way mental health care is provided in America. Um, we're, we're not humble about this. <laughs> um, but, you know, we don't think this is going to cover every child at all. It's not going to happen that way. Here's our um, timeline. Be happy to answer questions about that later. Um, you know, we hope that we will be able to show that we can reduce the number of symptoms that kids have after 12, 12 meetings, 12 weeks in school, and that hopefully we will enhance their coping, enhance their emotion regulation, their resilience, et cetera. So again, the goals are to show changes over time relative to kids who don't have the program during the same amount of time. The risks are low because we've already done this, although we got stopped halfway. We know we can improve the uh, racial makeup of the group. We know that attrition is going to be very low in schools. It was about 98% attendance the last time we did it. 
That doesn't happen in community studies. Any of you who do that work know this. So we've been able to uh, address the challenges, um, and we have a dissemination plan in place. We're being asked about this program um, for different school systems in the country. We want to get this money so that we can um, buy all the materials that are needed to um, produce the program. We can pay participants and staff, and certainly we will be able to pay the teachers. So the point is, we're ready to go. The need is huge. This is one solution. Doesn't account for everybody. At the end of the 12 sessions, we'll be able to see who else has problems that need to be referred to those individual, very expensive therapists. Um, we're not undermining that. We're just trying to add more. So we're ready to go. The need is great. What are we waiting for? Mental wealth for all. Thank you. And uh, we'll turn it over, as I should have, to the judges for, for questions. Who wants to start? Yeah. <laughs> so it's such an exciting proposal and you know, so critical for our children. I'm curious to understand a little bit more about the, breadth, the, the demands of time for the teachers and right. where the, the education system comes in and what resources and how much you've explored how feasible it would be given also our, our teachers are challenged, right, with time. Right, that's a very good point. Teachers are busy. They're not trained in mental health at all. The program is set up with activities. There is a training manual that teachers would read before each session to understand the research behind why we're, for example, in the first session we're gonna talk about problem solving. So what are the problems that kids have to solve? How do they do it? What's a good solution? and what's not, and how do you make those judgments to enhance kids' thinking about solving problems. This is very helpful to teachers. They've asked us to come into the schools. They're very excited about this. There is a mandate now in the state of Michigan to provide psychosocial education, to provide social skills type training. So this goes a little beyond just the social relationships aspect, um, but the teachers are, are very excited about it, and they've asked us to come back and teachers, you know, we're only gonna do so many classrooms with this model, um, with this uh, proposal, but um, they wanna be able to continue it in their school. So it's just pretty popular because the teachers are the ones who deal with, you know, little Susie or little Johnny who is acting up and having trouble or can't pay attention or is so sad and, you know, depressed they're under the bed, um, under the table and not participating. So the, the teachers can see the need every single day and they're, they're behind it. But we'll have a satisfaction survey at the end as well, so they'll be able to tell us what would have helped, what would be better. So hopefully we'll you know, adapt it to their, their wishes too. Um, I appreciate the presentation and, and your uh, enthusiasm and, and the great need that's out there. Um, so just to follow up, uh, I had two questions. Will that replace the socio-emotional curriculum in these classes? Um, and is that sort of the comparison group in those that don't get it? And the other question is just to say more about the online arm of what you're proposing, to understand that a little bit more. Right. Well, some schools don't have any so so you know emotional developmental program at all. So the schools that we're, we're using now do not have that, so that wouldn't be competing but they will get this program and then they'll be able to use it for the kids who are in the comparison group. And that way everybody in the study, all 150 kids. So if we do nothing else, 150 kids will get you know, the advantage of this, this program. Um, I, what was your second part again? Online. Oh, right, right. Okay, so doing this online is an opportunity to test out whether, we, we tried it online, it went pretty well, there was more attrition than there would be in the school setting. We didn't get a very representative sample. We'd like to try it again because not everybody is going to want to have this in school or be, have it available, but there are plenty of people who um, might want this type of, of treatment, this type of you know, next step in getting, getting help for, for problems. So we just wanna see if that's gonna be available usable, acceptable, whether it's gonna be as effective. It was, it was amazing to us that we found some results because you know, it, was, it was 
during COVID, kids were you know, already all day online, and yet even that amount of help uh, was useful. So there's some, another avenue for helping people. Thanks, I just have one clarification and one question. So the teachers would be the interventionists for this project? They would be working with other people. So they can be working with, we have in one school, the school psychologist wants to do this. And we will be working with teachers with our research team of undergraduates. The online program was done with all undergraduates. We have amazing, yeah. amazing trained people here at Michigan who can do you know, just really first rate work uh, working with children in groups. And so that's been a great model for us. So the teacher and a teacher assistant, typically they have, most classrooms have at least one other person available. I really appreciate the enthusiasm, especially the idea of meeting something out for many students, as, as many students as possible. The other question is, and maybe it might just be the schools that you're able to work with right now is, I guess, what's the population that's resourced by Honey Creek Charter School and Dickin Elementary School? Well, they're two very different schools. Honey Creek School is a charter school. It has a high white population. Um, it's Ann Arbor parents who, you know, as you know, high SES, high education, it's tough to do research around here. Um, the, the children in Dick Elementary School have a much lower SES and a much greater representation of minority kids. It's a mixed community with um, suburban type houses, but also some um, low income housing units to make up the difference. But it's got a greater population of kids who are black, um, kids who are with low income families, et cetera. And so that's why we chose that school. They are thrilled to have us there. Okay, well, thank you very much. Great. <laughs>
we are now getting almost all of the majority of our calories from ultra processed foods. This used to be a special treat. You know, you'd pick up a little Debbie snack cake or you'd have a little salty snack. This used to be something that's special. It's now the main thing that we eat to get our calories in the US and in other countries. Alongside this rise in ultra processed foods has been this steep increase in depression. You know, it, raises the question, is this possibly this changing food supply, this changing food environment, is this a potentially overlooked contributor that's feeding increases in depression? Ultra processed foods clearly impact so many parts of our body and our brain that are key to our mental health and well-being. Ultra processed foods damage the good bacteria in our gut where many of our neurotransmitters are produced. It causes inflammation in our body that makes us feel stressed. It increases wear and tear in our DNA that increases our age. In the brain, ultra processed foods powerfully activate reward systems about to the same degree as addictive drugs like nicotine and alcohol. And once the more you eat them, the more you eat these rewarding ultra processed foods, your reward system of the brain adapts. And now you need more and more intense hits of reward to get the same feeling that you used to. So it really shouldn't come to a surprise to us that people who eat the most ultra processed foods are 44% more likely to experience depression. If someone's had a depressive episode and they're eating high levels of ultra processed food, they're at a 30% increased risk of having relapse. And this isn't just a problem for depression. We see that about half of individuals with bipolar disorder report compulsively eating these foods and ultra processed foods in a way that feels addictive to them. This is also a problem for children and teenagers. As adults, we're getting about 50% of our calories from ultra processed foods. For our teens and our kids, it's more like 60%. This is really concerning when we think of teens as being at particularly high risk for the onset of mental health conditions right as their ultra processed food intake goes through the roof. For many people who don't have a lot of money and struggle to get food on the table, ultra processed foods are an even larger part of their diet. And many under-resourced communities, particularly communities of color, they're not only food deserts where there's no healthy food available, but they're food swamps. So in every corner, there's an advertisement and a promotion that's pushing the ultra-processed food as a resource for you. For many, ultra-processed foods are their only source of calories to get through the day. My team really wants to get under the hood and understand how ultra processed foods are contributing to low mood and depression. We hypothesize that ultra processed foods and depression feed each other in a vicious cycle. So you're feeling down, you're feeling a little low, and so you have an ultra processed food that's gonna give you a little spark of reward to help you cope. And for a moment it works. You get a rush of blood sugar, you see an increase in the reward centers of your brain, but a couple hours later your blood sugar crashes. You feel low, you feel fatigue, and now you're craving another hit of ultra processed food which feeds forward this cycle. That's what we hypothesize. If you're doing this at night, when so many of us collapse into our couches and put on our worst junk TV and you're eating these foods as you're snacking along, your blood sugar is going to crash in the middle of your sleep cycle and it's going to start disrupting your sleep, which is going to be another contributor to mental health problems. We have compiled an interdisciplinary team of a clinical psychologist, myself, a medical doctor, and a registered dietitian to uncover how ultra processed foods are contributing to depression. We will recruit 75 individuals with moderate to severe depression based on a semi-structured clinical interview who are frequent ultra-processed food consumers. That's most of us, so that won't be hard to find. For one week, we will leverage innovative technologies in the Eisenberg Family Depression Center cores to measure the impact of ultra-processed foods on mood, depression symptoms, and sleep in real time. Each participant will download an app called LifeSource on their phone, and they'll log their mood and depression symptoms at multiple times a day, particularly right before they eat and about two hours after they eat. We'll also ask them to take pictures on their app of anything they eat and drink, so we'll be able to know the exact timing that they've had ultra-processed foods.
And we're going to leverage a new technology called a continuous glucose monitor that provides us a biomarker of people's nutrition. It's like two little quarters that you stack on the back of your arm, and it unobtrusively, 24-7, measures your blood sugar spikes and crashes throughout the day. We want to tie that in there. And then with guidance from the Eisenberg Family Depression Center Mobile Technology Corps, we'll also have participants who wear the wrist actiographs and will have an objective measure of their sleep as well as a bonus of being able to measure their physical activity. So we'll really, by being able to leverage all these technologies, be able to have a very clear moment by moment picture of what's going on in their blood glucose, their sleep, their mood, their depression, their eating and their drinking. At the end of this week, we will be able to know for each participant how ultra-processed foods, low mood, and sleep are fueling each other to contribute to depression. Right now, we really aren't thinking of food as part of our mental health and our mental well-being. Can you think of a time that you were speaking to your doctor and they talked to you about what you eat and how it might be impacting your depression or your anxiety or the way you're feeling? They'll talk to you about it for your blood pressure, for your high cholesterol, but not when it comes to your mood. We really think that by really investigating this deeply, we might be able to provide new psychoeducation materials to start to bring food into the equation of how we understand how we flourish and how we nourish our minds and our bodies. But could the relationship between food, mood, and depression also present an opportunity for treatment? After all, we all have to eat. No one gets to opt out, right? We do it multiple times a day. So could this provide us with an opportunity to actually start nourishing the body and the mind in a way that would help reduce depression? Our team isn't going to stop at just understanding how ultra-processed foods contribute, but we also want to see whether we can use food to help fix the problem. We want to use food as a potential medicine for depression. Emerging research that's just been coming out in the last couple of years have found, has found that nutritional counseling that suggests to people that they reduce their ultra-processed food intake and they increase their intake of real nourishing foods like fruits and vegetables and lean meats and whole grains can improve depression scores within a matter of weeks. And the effect size of these inter nutrition interventions for those who take the advice is on par with the treatment effect size of antidepressants and it has none of the side effects. But you may have caught the catch in my last slide. It was for those who were able to change their diet, right? Planning, prepping, preparing minimally processed food meals that is nourishing is so much more work than throwing the frozen pizza in the oven and going through the drive through I get it. I know this stuff like the back of my hand. I am also the mother of a four-year-old and a one-year-old and a 13-year-old wiener dog. And my evenings do not look like this happy family, like joyously cutting up some vegetables together. There is screaming, there is crying, and there are crayons on the wall. I do not, it is chaos dinner time, right? And so I am a big fan of thinking about convenience as a key part of this equation. If you think about this, especially if you're struggling with depression, you have low, meat, low mood, fatigue, overwhelm, the idea of learning this whole new brand new skill set of planning, prepping, creating these meals can feel wildly overwhelming. We don't want to just tell people, eat this, not that. We want to help them do it in a way that really actually fits in their life. The good news is, in the last decade, a booming $11 billion industry has popped up that delivers prepped and tasty, minimally processed food meals. This has really gone up during the pandemic and became even more popular. 50% more families tried meal kits for the first time in the last couple years. And there's been a bigger and bigger focus on making these meal kits very convenient. And now that there's a whole line for many of the meal kit companies that they can be ready in less than 10 minutes and you really just pop them in the oven. In my lab, we created our own meal kits of nourishing food with the University of Michigan Metabolic Kitchen. And we provided them for three days to people who felt that they were addicted to ultra processed foods. And we checked in with them on their food cravings, their mood, their anxiety, and their sleep. We were really surprised that people immediately reported improvements in mood, sleep, and anxiety. But even more surprising is that when they stopped getting the meal kits after that really short period of three days, and we followed up with them two weeks 
weeks later, they had maintained those gains. That really surprised us. So we really want to put this to the test by developing an industry partnership with a meal kit company to test this as a potential new treatment for depression with support from the Eisenberg Family Depression Center Research Innovation Corps. We want to take those same 75 individuals with moderate to severe depression who completed our week of monitoring during their typical high ultra processed food diet, and we'll provide them with two weeks of minimally processed nourishing meal kits for their meals and snacks with our industry partner. We'll complete the same assessments, real-time assessments of mood, eating, blood glucose, sleep, and physical activity during these two weeks, and we'll measure their depression by clinical interview at the end. We want, we'll also ask them about their experience. How manageable was this? How did this fit into your life? How did you feel about it? And at the end of this intervention, we'll provide participants with nutrition guidance and contact information so they can continue this journey if they would like to. And we'll follow up with them one month and six months out to both look at what's their current diet quality and what are their current depression scores to see how long this actually maintains for them to look at durability. Some more details briefly about how we would use the budget. Most funds go, most funds go to a participant compensation, meal kit cost, and the purchase of technologies like actiographs and continuous glucose monitors. It's very feasible. We've given ourselves six months to start up our work using the data and design core at the Depression Center to refine our protocols, the mobile technology core to advise us on our use of actigraphy and ecological momentary assessment, and we'll work with the research innovation core to develop our industry partnership. We have a backup plan in case we aren't able to find that industry partner to use the metabolic kitchen to do this same work so we have really impressive data to then take to the industry and say, look what we could do together. Please join us in helping to not improve just physical health, but mental health. And this we don't see as the end of a research question. We see it as the beginning of entire research program. As I mentioned, we see that these ultra processed food intake is sky high in bipolar disorder as well, because we could look at it in this population. As we mentioned, people who are under-resourced and food insecure are relying on ultra processed foods to make it through the day. They're also a particularly a particular group at high risk for depression. We could look at this as a potential intervention in that context as well. And what I'm dying to do is to see the trickle down effects if you provide these to families to see if children and adolescents start getting more nourishing meals. Could this work not only as potential intervention, but a prevention tool as well to change physical and mental well being? At the end of this project, we will know how ultra processed foods are feeding depression and whether convenient, nutritious meal kits can be part of the solution. We are so excited about this because there is already a large economically viable industry providing the meal kits. They've done the hard work. They've figured out how to make this work. We aren't starting from scratch. What I can see happening is that we can pair with large insurers like the University of Michigan. The cost to meal kits is really the big obstacle that's preventing people from doing them. We have tons of employee wellness programs. If you could imagine if someone like the University of Michigan saw that providing subsidized meal kits not only improved the physical health of their, of their staff, but also reduced their depression, their anxiety, improved their sleep, improved their mental well-being, the cost savings on that are huge. So it's really win-win for both of these groups. At the end of this, we want to leverage the food we eat every single day so it supports mental health rather than damages it. Damages it. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Okay, questions? So uh, I can jump in. Yeah, great yeah. presentation. Um, uh, fascinating. Um, I, I, one of the, I guess, mm -hmm just to challenge a little bit. Sure. It sounds like, you know, healthy meals would be excellent mm -hmm. for a whole range of conditions, not just depression, Absolutely. obesity, diabetes, Absolutely. you name it. So if you're envisioning um, prescribing this for people mm -hmm. with depression, wouldn't you be opening, isn't it opening a can of worms? And is it even a sustainable mm -hmm. practice to even road to go down, I guess, is like, the, the questions. Is yeah. Bit, yeah. So if I'm understanding you correctly, that part of the question is that, you know, this isn't just, wouldn't just be effective for depression and anxiety, but you could see it having downstream effects for obesity, diabetes, all of those sorts of things. And yeah. And that 
can we basically give planned meals, you know, prepared meals to everybody that, yeah. that would need them? And could we afford that? And, uh, you know, I guess it's, it's a kind of an implementation Absolutely. scale question. I think that's an excellent question. And I think we need to do this research to be able to do the economic sort of analyses. And actually, Dr. Joyce Lee, who's one of our um, colleagues on this, actually does this sort of economic analysis on the effectiveness of these sorts of treatments for adolescents who have type 1 diabetes. So she does the, the continuous glucose monitoring and um, EMA on that. I think if we can get a sense of the magnitude and the durability of these sorts of convenient meal kits and how much they would need to be subsidized, we could think about, does this make sense for someone like U of M or another large insurer to get the benefits of reduced cost of type 2 diabetes medication, um, sleep apnea machines, but also depression, anxiety. If we think about it, as so many people have referenced here today, our mental health care system's on the ropes. And something like this, if you have somebody who's not able to access a provider or the stigma of being going to see a provider is going to be an obstacle, then these meal kits, which are usually, I do them right now to test this out since I want to do it, it's about $9 a meal. Um, and so this isn't wildly expensive stuff. Um, if we think about the subsidizing, I think we can answer these sorts of questions once we have a better sense of the effect size. But I think you bring up a good point that it's not just one outcome, but multiple outcomes. So we will be doing um, uh, body bioelectrical impedance analysis, which gives us a sense of muscle mass, body fat distribution, body weight, for these individuals as well, so we could look at a more holistic approach of understanding the cost of benefits. That's a great question. Yeah. I have a follow-up question sure. to that online. Mm -hmm. um, given his question, yeah. the question was, uh, if you have underprivileged populations mm -hmm. in food deserts and they have those additional risk factors, how would you address that more generally? Yes. So. Um, Again, what we're seeing right now is our current government programs that are looking to provide support for individuals who don't have enough money to get food actually increases their intake of ultra processed foods because the foods that are convenient and affordable and you know, at their house are those foods. They sit there, they're shelf stable, you know, that Twinkie that never dies, right? And so when I think about this, I get excited about this idea of could we replace something like a SNAP program where people are actually getting these meals delivered to their house and they get to pick them out? I mean, I think this is part of it that we, this is something people already want to do. It's an $11 billion industry and it's growing all the time. So we don't have to you know, try and convince people that this might be something fun to try. I think we'll have people who are excited about it. We're already spending a ton of money trying to support individuals who are food insecure and under-resourced, but the programs are making their physical and I would argue mental health worse by giving them ultra-processed chemical concoctions that damage their health, and we can do other things. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's it's somewhat along the same sure. lines, but I, I had a question about the population that will be mm -hmm. in your study and yes. the, the diversity of that population. Absolutely. E economic as well, because, mm -hmm. um, and I might suggest if you yeah. proceed with this, that you include somebody on your team that understands the payer space, mm -hmm. uh, because yes. Medicaid is a very different payer than the University of Michigan. Oh, yes. And the population that's most in need, mm -hmm. um, I think those meal companies have not targeted that population. No, so. you're absolutely correct. It's clearly been kind of targeted towards more uh, affluent populations. I mean, if you see the ads and the commercials, I was looking at some of them and I was like, this is the least diverse campaign I've seen. So um, I fully agree with you that as you think about scaling this up as well to different populations, you need the expertise. We actually have some colleagues and do some work with food insecurity, understanding the problem, but not so much trying to think necessarily about how this intervention might fit in that portfolio. For this original um, test, we don't have any inclusions or exclusions regarding socioeconomic status. Um, when we've done these meal kits in the past, when we did it in our prior study, we have had a wide range of individuals from different socioeconomic status. Um, and we did, I mean, essentially people were beating down our door to get in this study because people want the free food, they want the meal kits, they want the experience. I think we could do some really um, thoughtful sampling to ensure that we were getting a diverse group of individuals to ensure that not just on um, you know racial, ethnic, socioeconomic status, but 
we're finding that food insecurity is just an incredible uh, negative impact for mental and physical health. And so I think we could oversample in those domains. Again, because it's been so easy to get participants. I'm um, going think... to slide in. Oh, sorry. Keep us on track. Okay. But... I think we can, we can really be thoughtful about who we enroll and how. Sir. All good? You're going to forget your... Forgive me for the intrusion. Fantastic presentation. Um, there's such energy. I, I sensed you could go for quite a while longer. <laughs> Accurate assumption. Um, okay, so that wraps up our our pitches. So let's give let's give all three groups a round of applause. I thought those were just fantastic. So judges, do you know where to go now? Off stage, basically. Um, so go have fun deliberating. And in the meantime, uh, now we're going to transition to our Seeds of Change Awards. And as a reminder, so what these awards are intended to applaud are efforts at low resource, high impact research. Uh, the three groups who are going to come up in succession have already won their awards. So this is really a time for celebration and it's an opportunity for us to to learn about what they're going to be doing and, and really getting excited about it. So uh, let's have our first uh, award award recipient come up, the, who the title of which is The Impact of Boarding on Children and Adolescents Who Require Inpatient Psychiatric Admission, Victor Hong. His co-investigators are Jessica Bailey, Dr. Alexander Rogers, and Natalie Burke. And Dr. Bailey and Burke are going to be co-presenting with Dr. Hong. We have Dr. H Dr. Hong in the house. Okay. You guys all mic'd up and ready to go? Use the podium. Sure. Hey everyone, honored to be here and uh, have our entire core team here. I'm um, going to introduce myself and then e each uh, member can introduce themselves and then we'll get started with the presentation. I'm Victor Hong. I'm the Medical Director of Psychiatric Emergency Services here at Michigan Medicine. And um, to my right here is Natalie Burke, the originator of the idea for this project. Hi everyone. My name is Natalie Burke. I am a DNP student at the University of Michigan as well as an ER nurse at U of M. Hi everyone, I'm Jessica Bailey. I'm a nurse practitioner on the Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Consult Service Line. Hi, I'm Alex Rogers. I'm one of the faculty in pediatric emergency medicine. I apologize, coming right from a shift. <laughs> you know, before we start, it just uh, strikes me that I, I'm looking at Dr. Rogers and his scrubs that uh, I think one thing that helps our team is that uh, all four of us clinically do work in the emergency department in, in different capacities. and. It sort of uh, gave us the motivation to really be passionate about this project, which is to study what happens to children and adolescents when they stay in the emergency department for hours and days waiting for an inpatient psychiatric bed. And so um, I think Natalie's going to start us off. All right. I would like you all to imagine this scenario. You were sleeping soundly, dreaming about, dreaming about the University of Michigan football team scoring a touchdown in the fourth quarter of a football game to beat the Ohio State University, when suddenly you wake up to the sound of your youngest child retching in the bathroom. You wake up to go and check on them. Your child is green, tearful, diaphoretic, and they look very unwell, and they're telling you, I'm having the worst belly ache of my life. And as a parent, you know that you need to take them to the emergency room. Something is wrong. When you get to the ER, things start moving very quickly. Labs and images are being collected. You're being seen by nurses and doctors. And before you know it, um, your provider is coming into the room telling you that your child has acute appendicitis. And they could get very sick if they're not treated and potentially die. However, very fortunately, the medical team makes you aware that they've already ordered IV antibiotics, they've consulted the surgical team, and the OR is actually ready to take your child within an hour in order to mitigate all of these risks. We'd like you to consider another scenario as well. The following week, you get a call from the school counselor asking to pick up your oldest child from school. Today, your child met with the school counselor and told them that they have started cutting again. 
Over the last three weeks, they've developed suicidal ideation. They've developed a plan. And even last night while you were at dinner, they called the suicide hotline. The school counselor asks you, asks you if you're able to take your child to the emergency room in order to have them complete a mental health evaluation by a psychiatrist. After seeing the nurse and the medical doctor in the emergency room, the mental health provider is contacted and you and your child have to wait for their arrival for an additional mental health assessment. It is several hours before the psychiatrist arrives and they meet with you and your child individually. At last, the psychiatrist explains that they recommend admitting your child to an inpatient psychiatric unit in order to address your child's immediate safety and initiate psychiatric treatment. You and your child end up waiting almost 48 hours in the psychiatric emergency room or the pediatric emergency room while you're waiting to, for a bed to become available. And when it does, it's two hours away from where you live. You ask the team if there are any other options available to you and your family in order to make this a little bit easier. And they let you know this is the safest option that we have for you. In many instances, medical treatment is, avail is immediately available to our patients in emergency settings. However, these same resources are not immediately available to our patients, whether they're a pediatric patient, an adolescent, or an adult experiencing a mental health crisis. In many situations, patients and their families are forced to wait in very small waiting rooms for hours to days as they wait inpatient psychiatric placement, as well as the initiation of psychiatric care. So we'd like to ask you, does this make sense that the care of a life-threatening psychiatric emergency like acute suicidality could be delayed for hours to days, while similarly life-threatening medical emergencies can be treated almost immediately with available resources? Thanks, Natalie. Yeah, as, as we review and think about the, the story and the disparities between those two scenarios, um, you know, a few things come to mind that we'll share and sort of lays out the background for uh, what we want to investigate. Uh, want to share a few facts first um, in that, as you're all aware, with the child mental health crisis that we're all going through in this, in this country, um, what this ends up leading to is that there's a very large disparity between the resources available. This is outpatient, inpatient, as well as intermediate care options uh, for our children and adolescents. What that leads to is really a lot more uh, kids coming to the emergency department for treatment and evaluation. So compared to 2019, 2020, the presentation of psychiatric emergencies uh, in the adolescent population increased by uh, over 30% just in that one year alone. And as we go along, projections are that it will continue to increase by five to 10% per year in the next five years. Many of these patients uh, require inpatient admission and to define the term boarding, uh, boarding is a relatively newer term in the mental health space, but it's certainly growing. And that really is the time between the decision that somebody needs a psychiatric inpatient bed and the time it takes to actually physically transfer them to that bed. Those boarding times have exploded. Uh, the pandemic has made it worse. Uh, in our psychiatric emergency department, just for you to know, in the past three years, our boarding times have doubled. Uh, the Joint Commission, our regulatory bodies, you know, recommends that boarding times do not exceed more than four hours. On, on average, our boarding times are 20 hours or more. There are a lot of barriers uh, to accessing inpatient care. Uh, there's limited inpatient bed capacity. Uh, there's a lack of mental health providers in general. Um, and really, when you're discharging somebody home with some kind of suicide risk, not only are the parents and children uh, really afraid, but there's a lack of resources with which to um, refer them to. And, uh, you know, we see it in our clinical work every day. We see um, the impacts of boarding on these children as well as their families. But surprisingly, there really has been a dearth of uh, evidence in the literature. In fact, there's really not many studies um, investigating what actually happens on a personal level to these children and their families. And of course, your hypothesis is that the boarding times, the longer it is, certainly does impact them negatively. Um, there are several studies that have uh, been done around boarding. Uh, first, there's many studies have been indicating that boarding times certainly have been increasing over the years, so we have that in the, in the literature. 
There are studies that show that adolescents with suicidal or homicidal ideation certainly are boarding much longer than those with other mental health issues and certainly much longer than those with a medical problem. Um, and boarding times in terms of disparities are certainly much longer with those who have public insurance versus private insurance, not surprisingly, and certainly those from minority backgrounds. Um, and this boarding has really just caused a huge backlog and, and um, uh, in the emergency departments. We are lucky here at the University of Michigan that we're very well resourced relative to other community hospitals. But there are hospitals in rural communities that um, kids get stuck there for uh, weeks at a time, believe it or not. Uh, the last study I'll share is that uh, there was a study of 88 facilities um, that boarded children and adolescent uh, patients. And um, 87 of the facilities that were interviewed um, said that they regularly engage in boarding practices. About 14% of those facilities reported that um, during the time that they were boarding, they received essentially no mental health care. So no, no medications were adjusted, and 18% of the uh, facilities, excuse me, only 18% of the facilities reported that any uh, type of psychotherapy was provided. So really, you know, you're just delaying the inevitable, which is that the inpatient care uh, is being delayed uh, hours to days. So again, boarding you know, is a serious concern, but there's just not a lot in the literature to support it. Uh, to support um, interventions. Uh, lastly, I'll just sort of uh, lay out our aims. So our team would like to study sort of the degree of impact uh, that boarding has on children and adolescents as well as their families. We want to know what's happening to their anxiety, their emotions, their depression. Is their suicidal ideation going up or down? How are they sleeping while they're in the emergency department? There's going to be a small pilot study. We hope to recruit 25 to 50. Um, parent-child pairs, and uh, just look at uh, to get some more objective data as well. We do know that in certain cases, when people are waiting for many days in the emergency department, they end up getting very agitated. Sometimes they require emergency medications and restraints. Uh, some kids have eloped from the emergency department, place, placing themselves at grave danger. And finally, um, and in the worst case scenario, a lot of times families give up and they get very frustrated with the wait times and they decide, even though their kid is at risk, to take their child home. This is a very stressful time for, for everyone. And um, our, our budget, you know, which is small, but will help us uh, conduct this pilot study. Most of the money will be used for research coordinators as well as a small incentive for parents and um, families uh, who, who are recruited. You know give it to Jessica to take us home. So we're very lucky to have a large research team. Um, we have, um, as Dr. Hong mentioned, several of us are frontline um, faculty and nurse, uh, nurses and myself an advanced nurse practitioner working in um, all aspects of the emergency room at University of Michigan Hospital. So we see this um, these problems most days that we are on service. Um, we also are very lucky to have um, a research scientist with an emergency medicine and psychology background, a clinical faculty with um, psychiatry research background in child and adolescent mental health. We are also very excited to have the research coordinators as well as the nursing and social work leadership within the hospital on our team. And we really believe that having this large interdisciplinary team that often um, interact face to face with these families and patients um, will help reduce the um, amount of confounders that um, will help improve the quality of our data at the end. Uh, right now, we're submitting to the IRB, and once that is approved, we're looking to recruit up until um, about June of next year. Um, once the recruitment, as Dr. Hong mentioned, we're hoping for about 25 to 50 participants. Um, once that is completed, we will look to analyze the data and complete our study by October of 2023. So what's the point? Uh, why are we here? You know, this is really all close to all of our heart on stage, as well as our research team. Um, we're really hopeful that looking at the data, um, this will help. This study is really going to help provide some quantitative data. Right now, as Dr. Hong mentioned, there are several studies out there looking at boarding. And really, it just continues to show that boarding continues to increase. But nothing's really looking at 
what is the what, what is going on during the boarding? Yes, there's a delay in their care. Yes, they're sitting for several hours and days, but what is happening to the patient while they're in crisis? Um, we're hopeful that this data is going to show the detriment, unfortunately, that we're seeing um, to the patient's mental health, um, that not only is their care stagnated, but likely their acute crisis, this is really not supporting them um, to sit there in the allowed, um, not really uh, su most in supportive environment for them at that time. Um, we're hoping that the data can help leverage funding for interventions that can be utilized during the boarding process for these kids that are sitting there for hours to days, literally just waiting um, for care. Uh, we're also helpful that the, the data can provide um, some interest for funding for additional psychiatric beds, which are needed not only in Michigan, but all over the country. Um, to put things in perspective, I know the state of Arizona only has one inpatient psychiatric unit in the entire state for ages 13 and over. So if your child has a mental health emergency and needs acute care, they need to go out of state. And imagine, um, you know, if a family is a single parent home um, or really doesn't have the resources to travel back and forth, visit with their child, focus on their child and other children in the home, it's really just not the best um, situation for them. And so we're hopeful that our data can help support that and provide future, future, future interventions. So thank you all for having us here and thank you to the Eisenberg uh, Depression Center. We really appreciate you. For this great work. Um, we have time for maybe one question from the audience or online uh, before we give out the award. Any questions for the group? What would the ideal care look like, do you think? And uh, while you wait, what um, would you like to see during that time? So right now, while they're boarded um, in our institution, really there is no protocol to have um, any type of therapy there's no educa psychoeducation about coping. Most kids, you ask them what coping is. If they've never been connected to services before, they don't even know what that is. They're not clear about the symptoms that they're experiencing or why they are experiencing what they're experiencing. So simple psychoeducation um, can be um, low resource and high yield, um, as well as therapy services that we have available in-house. Um, as, and I'm sure Dr. Hong or Dr. Rogers also have other ideas as well as about what their ideal is. I mean, that's, <laughs> um, okay, and, and I mean, one, I know we're, we're running out of time. We are expanding the pediatric emergency department um, and both for medical and for, um, you know, but we'll be able to house more of the psychiatric patients as well. So that construction is underway. And I think learning a bit about some of the, you know, there are a lot of things that could be improved in the global sense, but some of the, the sort of the pressure points um, may help us kind of design a better experience you know, while we're waiting. Um, and we're hoping for, you know, obviously there's some global changes that could be made, but even some micro changes. And as we create this new space, which is currently under construction, I think there are some opportunities. So thanks. Um, one, Dr. Sen. Thank you for doing this really impressive and important work. <laughs> oh, and I think we're Victor? We'll take, taking a picture. Here. Yes. Yeah, just come over so everybody's in the light, not in the shadow. It's a good broader. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, the room, just like that. Yeah, perfect, just like that. Squeeze on. You don't look like you want on the wall. Do you, do you mind the bullet on top of their heads, or do you want them to change that, or is that, that's okay? Okay, great. All right, thank you. All right, so our next uh, presentation is going to be in a project called Empowered at Home and Connected by Jay Kayser, who's a PhD student in School of Social Work and Psychology, and his co-investigator, Dr. Zhang, from, uh, who's an assistant professor uh, in the social work school. Jay, do you want to come up? Yep. Hi. Well, my thanks to Eisenberg for putting together this great event, um, right down to the details of color coordination on the stage and the carpet. So. <laughs> Um, I have it on the authority of the cameraman that I am able to wander around a little bit, so I might be doing that. 
So before I get started, I wanted to take a moment to thank some of the people that have made all of this work possible. So the program that serves as a foundation for what I'll be talking about today was funded by the Michigan Health Endowment Fund, as well as matching funds from Michigan Medicaid. That project is led by Dr. Shailene Chan, who's an assistant professor in the School of Social Work and put a tremendous amount of work and effort into that program. It is also supported by our project assistant, Skyla Turner, as well as a large and hardworking group of uh, undergraduates, pardon me, undergraduates, uh, community partners, and other stakeholders. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. I know it's a cliche, but I'll say it anyway. People are inherently social. When I was a kid, on days that I didn't have school or that he was working late, my dad would take me to his job. He was an audiologist, and a lot of his patients lived in nursing homes or senior apartments or assisted living facilities, so he made a lot of home calls. He'd take me with me, he'd take me with him on these visits, and I'd get this intimate glimpse into the lives of his patients. He would tinker with hearing aids, he would change batteries, he would test hearing, and a lot of the folks that he saw were alone. Over the course of the visit, I would see this change in them, from someone that was initially frustrated to someone that became warm and sociable. And a lot of this, I imagined, must have come from the healthcare, from being able to have hearing restored to them. But I think even then, I realized that some of it came from something else, from being able to have a warm conversation, from that togetherness of being able to talk. I watched these interactions, and it wasn't until much later in my life that I realized just how much it imprinted on me. So my path. Years later, I went on to get a master's in social work. And after I graduated, I went to work in a hospital in the emergency department, large city, St. Louis. And one of the reasons that I loved that job so much was that it gave me the chance to interact regularly with older adults. And the folks that came into the emergency department often came in with much more than just medical needs. They had difficult life circumstances, they were socially isolated, and they were depressed. When it came to being able to address social concerns from the emergency department, we were really limited in what we were able to do. We were providing Band-Aid care for an issue that was much larger than we were able to address. In order to provide more than that Band-Aid care, I came here to the University of Michigan, where I'm studying now in the joint PhD program in social work and psychology. In my work, I aspire to understand the trends and the psychosocial needs of older adults, and then use that information to develop interventions. So that's why I'm really excited to tell you today about a program that I'll be testing called Empower at Home Connected. A few statistics for you. By 2030 in the US, one in five persons will be over age 65. Between 2018 and 2060, the census predicts that the number of older adults in the US will more than double. So this makes older adults the fastest growing age demographic in the United States. Despite this, most mental health intervention research focuses on those under 65. Certain subgroups are at especially high risk of developing issues. Nearly one in two homebound older adults suffer clinically significant depression. Effective treatments for depression exist. That's important and it bears repeating, so I'll say it again. Effective treatments for depression exist. However, those treatments oftentimes are unavailable due to lack of clinicians, unaccessible due to life circumstances, or in the case of homebound older adults with limited mobility, just not possible. So telemedicine has done a lot to close this gap. Think about certain communities, for instance, uh, in rural healthcare, primary cl care clinics that are accessible through telemedicine. Telemedicine has yet to really be fully leveraged in the treatment of older adults with depression and complicated health needs. 
Innovation is desperately needed to expand access to mental health services. And this project that I'll be talking about does exactly that. The project that this is all based on, Empower at Home, is a novel nine session remotely delivered intervention that is, includes cognitive behavioral therapy content like uh, psychoeducation, uh, sort of tailored content to address the unique life circumstances of older adult, adults. As participants are completing it, they finish it self-directed. So they do have a supportive coach that will call them about once a week. They give them a little bit of encouragement, short conversation, but it's mostly self-led. Uh, for folks that don't have financial means, we are able to provide tablets to them free of charge that also come with mobile hotspots. The program I'll be testing differs from Empower at Home in two important ways. So this program, this variant, Empower at Home Connected, uh, will still leverage those assets of the main program while having those two differences. Empower at Home Connected will involve expanded materials addressing loneliness and social isolation, and rather than being delivered individually, will be delivered in a group setting where participants will have the chance to learn alongside, get to know, and spend time with their peers in a, in a group of four to six folks. The use of resources such as tablets, recorders, shipping supplies, and other project essentials from the parent project will far extend the value and impact of the funds provided through the Seeds of Change grant. We hope to enroll 20 to 25 participants residing throughout Michigan in this study, and it has two aims. So the first aim is just to adapt Empower at Home to this group format that also includes expanded material around social isolation and loneliness. The second is to test the feasibility of this new inter intervention. So we're looking at the preliminary effect as well. So funding from the Seeds of Change grant provides a valuable opportunity to both tailor and test this intervention and paves the way for future adaptations of Empower at Home should we be successful with this. The project will take place in four different stages and an IRB for this has already been approved. So during the first stage, the intervention will be developing this intervention. So this will involve putting together manualized material so we can be consistent on our delivery throughout this intervention and any other interventions that might follow that would use this protocol. During the second stage recruitment, we'll be looking for those 20 to 25 participants. The parent project that this is structured around has been able to successfully recruit around 100 participants within the space of about three months, so I'm optimistic about our ability to meet that target. The third stage will be the actual intervention itself. So in groups of four to six, it will be in consecutive weeks. As a clinical social worker, I will facilitate these groups. There will also be a trained research assistant available that will be uh, do conducting comprehensive psychosocial assessments throughout their course of this program. The last stage, analysis and dissemination. So this will involve looking at our data, manuscript production, sending off to colloquia, and really importantly, also sharing our findings with the community that participated in this and the community that stands most directly to benefit from it. So this study adds to a nascent body of literature around remotely delivered interventions for older adults with mental health concerns like depression, experiencing loneliness and with complex physical health needs. So it also does something on a, on a micro level where we get to give this service to 20 to 25 people, which is important, but it does something more important on a larger level. So with the demographic changes in our society, interventions that are tailored, cost efficient, effective and accessible will be increasingly needed. This funding positions me to take part in that innovation, innovative research to create those interventions, not just through the remainder of my doctoral studies here, but into my career in the future. To close things out, I want to return to that, that opening thought. People are inherently social, and our mood and well-being are intimately and inextricably tied to our day-to-day -day social realities. This program will both build on and honor that maxim. Thank you. And any questions? A little bit of time. Is it a 
Yeah, so this is all remotely delivered. So we are able to, if they have internet, if they have a computer that has a camera on it, this is all screen delivered throughout the entirety of it. And if they don't have that, we are able to send that to them with a hotspot that they are able to use during the duration of the study. And we do have tech support that is a part of this because there is this parent project. There's been this ability to really fine tune how we work with people, keep them engaged. That said, attrition still is a concern, especially when you're dealing with a, a population where there might be a much higher risk of hospitalization, other things that come up that might distress their ability to remain in the study. That's just an unfortunate fact of, of kind of working within this population. But great question. Thank you. Well, thank you for, for uh, a wonderful presentation and wonderful research. You want to come up on stage, Dr. Sen? Get ready to smile. Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, and our final presentation for the evening, Novel Cognitive Training Video Game to Target Subclinical Depressive Symptoms in Youth. Hannah Becker, PhD candidate in uh, the Department of Psychology, is the PI and will be presenting. Her uh, co-investigators are, are many, Dr. Adrian Belts, Dr. Emily Billick, uh, Dr. Kate Fitzgerald, and Dr. Christopher Monk. And Dr. Billick will be co-presenting with Dr. Becker. Do you want to come on stage? Did I get Billick right? Got it. Got right. one. And I'm not Dr. Becker yet, but hopefully eventually. <laughs> um, okay, great. So we're going to get started. Uh, today we'll be presenting our proposal for a novel cognitive training video game to target subclinical depressive symptoms in youth. And this is our wonderful, supportive, and interdisciplinary research team. So I'm Hannah Becker. I'm a PhD candidate in the clinical psychology department here at uh, Michigan. And I'm uh, Dr. Emily Billick, and I'm clinical faculty in the Department of Psychiatry. Yeah, and so this is our wonderful team, and we declare no relevant uh, conflicts of interest today. OK. So we are in the midst of an adolescent mental health crisis. You've heard this many times today. Um, millions of youth in our country are struggling from clinical depression. So what I mean by that is their symptoms meet criteria for all of the diagnostic criteria of depression. And fortunately, we have pretty good treatments for depression in kids and teens. For instance, cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, is one of our best, most effective uh, psychotherapeutic interventions for uh, depression in kids and teens. But we are, you know, CBT is very time and resource intensive. Uh, and also, as you've heard many times today, we do not have nearly enough providers or clinicians to actually meet the demand or the need of all of the children that are struggling with clinical depression. So in addition to all the kids struggling with clinical depression, a huge subset of the population also experiences symptoms of depression at the subclinical level. So basically what these are are symptoms that are similar to depression, like low mood or loss of interest in things that one typically enjoyed, but they don't quite pass the threshold to meeting criteria for clinical depression. So what do we do about all of these kids that are struggling, uh, especially at the subclinical level? Um, you know, we can't even meet the need of all of the children struggling from clinical depression. And we also know that having subclinical depression is one of the biggest risk factors for then going on to develop clinical depression. So the need for a preventative intervention here is, is very clear. So put simply, our goal with this project is to reduce the burden of depressive symptoms, both on the individual child as well as on society as a whole. The optimal solution will be readily accessible, cost effective, and sufficiently engaging that teens will use it proactively before symptoms become so impairing that they need a higher level of care. 
consider the flu shot. If we get people access to the shot before they get sick, we really have um, a strong opportunity and are very likely to reduce the burden of illness, the severity of illness for individuals, and reduce the burden on society through healthcare systems, economy, things like that. So today we'll be talking about a possible, possible potential um, partial solution to the burden that depression puts on individuals and our society. But I'm not going, we're not going to be talking about a vaccine for depression. Um, in fact, as you may have guessed from our title, we're going to be talking about a video game. And this is an image from the actual game, which is called Endeavor RX. With Endeavor RX, we have an opportunity to change the trajectory for teens who are at high risk of developing clinical depression. Endeavor RX is a video game, um, and it has been FDA approved to support the treatment of ADHD. It does this by targeting cognitive vulnerabilities that are found in individuals with ADHD. But interestingly, youth with anxiety and depression share these same cognitive vulnerabilities. Perhaps if we can train youth to strengthen these cognitive skills, we can target depressive um, risk factors before symptoms become impairing. Not only does this program have a really high potential to address these risk factors for depression, it also addresses many of the uh, barriers to treatment that we've been talking about a lot today already, actually. So number one, the program is accessible. It's accessible at home without delay. Families don't have to wait weeks or months for a provider to become available. They can use the program at home as soon as symptoms begin to develop. Number two, the program is cost effective. Endeavor RX costs $100 out of pocket, which in mental health care terms is probably on par with co-pays for four psychotherapy sessions. And it's probably cheaper than a single psychotherapy session paid out of pocket. And number three, the program is engaging. Youth report enjoying playing the games, which is crucial to ensuring that the program is delivered and you know, completed as it is intended. Just like with the flu shot, if we can make effective prevention accessible, easy to access, maybe even desirable to access, we can really increase the likelihood that we will have a meaningful impact. So this is the goal of Hannah's study, to examine whether a video game, a video game, can target <laughs> cognitive vulnerabilities in youth to alter the course of depressive symptoms. To test this idea, we should really focus on a study population that is at high risk of developing clinical depression. And we are fortunate, actually, to have the perfect population to test the hypothesis that we can reduce uh, depressive symptoms with this video game intervention. We actually, our research group completed this study with 150 anxious youth a few years ago. Um, and just like subclinical depressive symptoms can really predict going on to develop depression, oftentimes if somebody is given an anxiety diagnosis, that also puts them at risk for going, going on to develop depression. Anxiety symptoms and depressive symptoms are highly comorbid, they highly co-occur. Um, so we went back and I looked at this population that we had already recruited, which we did actually assess depressive symptoms a few years ago, but we never looked at them. So I wanted to go back and we looked at this anxiety population and saw that they were in fact um, very high on levels of subclinical depression. So my goal is to re-recruit them as part of this uh, new study that I'm proposing. Uh, and fortunately, everything that I'm gonna be talking about just now can be completed remotely, and this will be my first time doing a completely remote study, but I'm really excited about um, kind of the barriers that this will overcome. And so, you know, if people have moved out of state, they can still um, be enrolled in our study. Anyway, I plan to re-enroll them and reassess their dep depressive symptoms before beginning the four-week Endeavor RX video game intervention with them. After the four weeks, we'll reassess their symptoms with the goal of hopefully reducing depressive symptoms over this four week period, which would indicate to us that they're now at a lower risk for then going on to develop clinical depression. And the Endeavor RX will be compared to this control video game, which is licensed by Achille um, Interactive, which is the company that owns Endeavor RX. And it's just a standard video game to compare. In addition to this, um, I. The original anxious youth uh, received this time-intensive, resource-intensive CBT that we've been talking about to treat their anxiety. And so I'm also curious to look at the interactions between the Endeavor RX video game and CBT or other psychotherapeutic interventions to see if we can use Endeavor RX to strengthen and boost, actually serve as a booster of cognitive control that might enhance the effects of CBT. So even if we 
are working with patients who have been um, who have received CBT before, we might be able to provide the Endeavor RX video game booster as a way to supplement uh, and maintain the uh, treatment effects that we originally saw. And so one of the great things about this uh, video game intervention is it's, um, it's, it's accessible and it addresses mental health disparities through this. Um, so many youth who are at risk for depression are at the same youth who experience um, barriers to accessing clinical care, which are very common. Um, this could include transportation, lack of transportation, and just the cost of the treatment itself. And so, you know, a standard CBT intervention, a parent has to drive their child maybe 30 minutes to an hour for 12 or more sessions. Um, for kids, this often involves finding childcare for the other kids because parents are involved in the intervention. And so this video game overcomes all of those barriers. Um, it can be done from home. It's a completely remote intervention. And one of the other neat things I think about the video game is that we know that stigma is one of the barriers to actually seeking care. Um, and that this uh, differs you know, across different groups of people. And so we hope that uh, because it's a video game and you can um, complete it completely from the privacy of your home, that this will reduce stigma and thus um, increase uh, treatment access. And so we're really excited to make use of the Eisenberg Family Depression Center research cores as well as part of this study. So I plan to work with the mobile tech core to actually set up maybe mobile reminders and ping parents and families uh, to make sure that children are completing and adhering to the video game intervention, the data and design core for help with statistical analysis, and the research innovation core uh, to help uh, improve the readability and accessibility of any findings that we will publish from this work. So that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much um, for listening to the Eisenberg Family Depression Center, um, to the rest of our lovely team. We're really grateful for this opportunity. Thanks. Okay, what? No, don't leave yet. Oh, we might have a co sorry. couple of questions here. Any questions? Yes. Yes. What age is this? Yes, great question. So it actually can scale to a variety of different ages. In our study, it will be a population of about 7 to 17-year-olds, so actually quite a large age range. But the original video game was designed for younger kids, and it's actually been tested in adults as well as a video game. And one of the best parts is it can scale to the individual level of difficulty to increase. Uh, it keeps the children engaged, which makes it more fun. Good question. Yeah. Do you speak to the length of time they need to play and frequency? Yes, absolutely. So the way that we are testing the intervention, which is how it's been tested previously, uh, is for 25 minute intervals for five days a week. Um, and we're going to be doing that for a four week period. I imagine a situation where you could supplement this with several booster interventions across time, but it's not a ton of time a day, especially we work with kids. We know how often they do play video games in a given day. Um, and this would actually be a good positive intervention. Great. Well, why don't you come, come on up, Srijan? Thank you. Oh, thanks so much. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks. And why don't we have the judges come back up on stage for the, the big reveal? Everyone, everyone ready? And let's also have our our candidates come up on stage. We're doing this properly here. There'll be music playing soon. <laughs> so I had asked the judges to just give me um, one or two comments about each proposal that I could that I could mention um, while while wrapping things up. And of course, you know, they gave me pages of comments, all all positive, which I think is a testament to the. Um, the quality of the work that, that we saw here today. I mean, I, I can say that sitting in the audience with my not MC hat on, but, but scientist hat on, like th this was just so exciting to see each group trying to tackle this really important issue from such remarkably different vantage points. Um, I think it was really, really inspiring. So without further ado, uh, our third place winner, uh, is rhythm and blues. Um, the the judges uh, commended commended the work for its 
potentially high ceiling. I mean, the, the effect size that was displayed was just remarkable. It's like one of those effects where you don't need statistics to, to test its um, significance. And, um, and so thank you for that work. Um, between the remaining two projects, this was very, very challenging. Uh, the winner, that was, I shouldn't delay that long. That was too long. <laughs> I'm just trying to, trying to count down in my head. Um, Ashley Gearhart and, and co, food is a risk factor. Um, the, the judges really commended your usage of, of the core um, and, um, and the innovation was really, really perceived quite high. And, and Sandy, your project too was also, this was a very challenging decision for the group. Um, the issue that you're addressing is hard to uh, you know, it's hard to contend with its significance and the novelty of the project um, really, really impressed the judges. So, so thank you all. Um, I, I, oh, I thought I said, didn't I say, I didn't say the, the winner clearly, Dr. Gearhart. Wow, I, I, I ended up inadvertently building more suspense than I had intended. Uh, you did, you might, your game show hosting days might be torture days. Yes, 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 yes. Um, but thanks, thanks everyone for coming. Um, um, thank you for being a great audience. Thanks all the presenters and the judges for, for doing what you've done. Um, it, is, it is reception time. Oh, pictures first. Okay, okay. It is reception time for all of you. And, um, but if you could stick around for some pictures, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.